Welcome to the Baptist Health Doc to Doc podcast, a conversation for physicians by physicians, providing insight on the latest in medical practice, research, technology, and innovation in healthcare on the Doc to Doc podcast. Many technological breakthroughs in the past decade have advanced how surgical procedures and diagnostic tools are applied. But the one tech breakthrough that has game-changing promise more than ever is AI. AI is rapidly becoming one of the most influential weapons in the battle for saving and enhancing lives. AI has dynamic potential in every aspect of modern day medicine. But today, we will focus our conversation on this potential within the field of cardiology and cardiothoracic surgery. Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Wayne, the Director of Middle Invasive Valve Surgery and Chief Medical Executive of Baptist Health, Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, and the Barry Cassidy Endowed Chair. And I'm uh, Dr. Nish Patil. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists at Baptist Health, uh, and I specialize in catheter-based uh, treatment of valvular heart disease, and I'm director of structural heart program at uh, Baptist. Thank you, Dr. Patel. I'm going to call you Nish because I work with you every day, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the powerful thing about AI is the ability to comb through mass amounts of data and, and come up with information for us. And one of the, the things that we do every day that has mass amounts of, uh, of data is the EMR system. Can you describe, you know, what AI or what kind of uh, uh, solutions that you've heard of uh, using AI that can comb through EMR and maybe do something that might help us be better doctors? Yeah, thanks, Tom, for the question. So, yeah, as you pointed out, uh, you know, we deal with uh, so much of data and the disease that we are treating is so complex. Uh, and uh, there's multiple studies which have been done, uh, you know, for one patient and how to go about all uh, those uh, studies and uh, making sure that we are treating the patient as early as possible. So, uh, you know, I've heard one solution. Uh, in fact, two of uh, the companies which have worked on it uh, were, you know, in our valvular heart disease space. Uh, they would look at your EMR and the entire journey of that patient since the patient came into the health system and look at their echocardiogram, look at their EMR uh, and, and, you, and for the audience out there, what's EMR? So EMR is electronic medical records. Uh, so, uh, going through the whole uh, electronic medical records, uh, going through the whole imaging uh, which has been done for the patients such as EKGs, echocardiogram or cardiac catheterization, they would able to tell that, let's say, if the patient has, uh, you know, aortic stenosis uh, in your system, uh, that, uh, you know, there are so many patients that we have in our health system. And there may be some patients are out there who have some disease uh, such as aortic stenosis, but they are not being treated for that. So uh, the, you know, the solution would be able to look at the EMR, look at those studies and uh, would be able to tell us that in your EMR, these are the number of patients who have severe aortic stenosis. And uh, if you uh, treat them earlier, you would be able to impact their mortality. And, uh, you know, it would also be able to tell you that, let's say, if the patient had an aortic stenosis a uh, few years ago uh, with the echocardiogram showing moderate aortic stenosis and, th and that patient had multiple echocardiograms, it would be able to tell you that uh, what's the progression of the aortic stenosis. And let's say if you do the echocardiogram right now, what are the chances that this patient has severe aortic stenosis? Um, and by doing that, you would be able to identify the patient uh, earlier in their disease journey rather than, you know, catching them later in the disease process where, you know, when we treat those patients, the outcomes are also not great. Versus when you treat those patients earlier in their disease journey, the outcomes are much better and you're impacting uh, their life expectancy earlier. You know, as physicians, we can only treat what we know. And there are yeah. a lot of patients who come in and they may not know they have aortic stenosis. They might come in with a stubbed toe and they get a ultrasound done that has severe aortic stenosis. And we know the natural history of aortic stenosis. Patients yeah. will die within two years. 50% of patients die within two years, but they might not know that. But being able to pick that up sooner could save a lot of lives. But why not just hire someone? You know, why not just hire someone to go and comb the medical records? You know, uh, how many people would that take? Is that feasible? Yeah, not feasible at all uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we can have, uh, you know, people looking through the echocardiogram, but still it won't be able to look at the whole EMR, won't be able to tell you that uh, what it, what's the rate of the progression of the disease. Uh, uh, and plus, you know, we still can have error. Uh, you know, there is a human error that uh, always uh, going to be there. So that's there. And Plus, it's a very labor-intensive job uh, for somebody to go through the whole chart. Uh, so I think 
right now, only few institutions are doing it, uh, and we are uh, a part of it. Uh, but in 10 years, this would be a norm that we won't be discussing about this. Uh, this is how the practice is uh, going to be done. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, AI is inevitable. It's going to change our future. It's just how we embrace it and yeah. how we regulate it Absolutely. is key. So we talked about combing medical records and, and, and coming up with um, a list of diseases, but maybe tell me more about how AI can assist us in making diagnoses, yeah. or particularly if it's a complex diagnosis. Yeah. It's, you know, another great question. Uh, you know, I just give an example. I, I saw a presentation and I attended a course also. Um, Paul Friedman is uh, he's a chief of cardiology at Mayo Clinic, and uh, you know I saw his presentation. And uh, Mayo Clinic has uh, an EKG algorithm that they have worked uh, for the past four or five years, uh, or even longer. And uh, EKG is such a simple tool. To most of the patients who come into the health system, most of the time they have an EKG done, and just by looking at the EKG, that algorithm can tell you that what's the patient's age and not the chronological age. What's the physiologic age of the patient? What's the gender of the patient? It would be able to tell you that the patient has a valvular heart disease or not. Do they have decreased ejection fraction, uh, you know, heart failure or not? If they have occult atrial fibrillation or not, and hypertensions, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So those kind of things, just an EKG is able to tell you where you know, no further uh, imaging has been done. Um, and you know about that uh, physiologic age uh, uh, part, uh, there was an example uh, uh, he gave where uh, a person who was a 50-year-old, AI predicted that the age of this patient is a 73. And then a few months later, uh, the same EKG uh, was done and the AI predicted the age is 25. So what happened? What could have happened? That just in three months, the AI predicted the age is 25. That patient uh, got a heart transplant. So he had a heart failure. He had a new heart? Yeah, he yeah. had a new heart. He had a 25-year-old heart. <laughs> and uh, the AI predicted the age is 25. And similarly, there was another patient who uh, was a 35-year-old and was obese. And uh, that AI predicted the age is 42. The patient lost about 20 pound and uh, afterward this uh, EKG was uh, repeated and now the AI predicted the age is 36, which was uh, the patient's chronological age. So how powerful that would be for the patient also that, uh, you know, this is what's your physiologic age and you need to do something about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to go as upstream as possible to diagnose the disease in the early stage because you're... I mean, having a primary care physician uh, notice something, let's say a patient's symptoms, and then uh, referring to a cardiologist and cardiologist doing some testing and then uh, finding out, okay, yes, there is an issue, and then referring to another specialized uh, physician to do some sort of procedure or surgery uh, about it. Rather than that, imagine if uh, a digital uh, stethoscope which primary care physician just use it uh, and uh, it would be able to tell you that, okay, patient has a valvular heart disease and uh, uh, patient just directly go to the person who's going to treat the patient. Now, I'll give another example. Uh, I guess we talked about heart disease, but the number two killer in the United States is actually lung disease or cancer. Uh, and there are AI algorithms out there now that can look at an x-ray and then find that little nodule and be able to tell whether that nodule looks suspicious or not. And something that most or many radiologists might not focus on because they have so many other things to focus on. And that's why I think the powerful thing about AI is in that, you know, we as humans learn by picking up patterns, right? We, we pick up patterns, but you can only kind of see things when you pick it up. With AI, it can use the mass data and pick up on patterns that we're not even seeing or recognizing. So the EKG has so much data on there, but in medical school, we learn basic stuff about it, the QRS interview, the PQRS, you know, et cetera. But there's often maybe other variations. We don't learn to look at maybe the depth of the QRS. We don't learn to look at the spacing between the intervals as much. Uh, and uh, and the beautiful thing about the, the, the big data um, with AI, it's, it's able to do that. I want to offer a really neat um, uh, experiment that's kind of similar to what you said with the EKG. Um, they uh, use AI to show ophthalmologists retina scans 
and then have the ophthalmologist try to predict whether it's a man or, or a woman. And of course, the ophthalmologist got it right half the time. But incorporating the AI, AI algorithm, it was pretty simple. They would show the retina scan of a man, and they would tell the AI machine learning, hey, this is a man, show a retina scan of a woman, here's a woman, and do that thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And the AI w was able to pick up things that, that most humans weren't able to recognize. So then they did it again and then showed a picture of a, a brand new picture of a, a retina scan of a man. And then the AI was able to get it right 97% of the time. I mean, it's amazing, yeah. right? It's amazing because you can only, we can only pick up what we know and see, but there's subtle things that the machine learning can pick up that we're not seeing. That's yeah. the power of it. Absolutely. I think, uh, I was just thinking that uh, by doing that examination, the AI probably can predict if the patient's going to have hypertension or diabetes because uh, retina get affected uh, with those diseases too. Um, and similarly, you know, there was Stanford uh, had this broad uh, algorithm that they have worked on, which is essentially, you know, so many patients get CAT scan, right? Uh, uh, patient come in and uh, they have some sort of issues uh, and the CT chest uh, is done multiple time. Uh, and one of the thing that we use uh, for risk stratification of asymptomatic patients is calcium score. Calcium score is essentially a scan of the heart and it tells you that how much calcium that you have in your heart artery and based on the score of that, we can predict that what is the chance of patient getting a heart attack in the next five to 10 years. Uh, higher the score, higher the chances of patient getting a heart attack. Uh, uh, so how can, uh, you know, if we can implement uh, the same thing on any scan which is done, not dedicated calcium score, because uh, any scan would also be able to identify the calcium in the heart artery. So they actually did that. And um, then later on, those patients who had uh, uh, calcium score elevation, uh, they did the study of notifying the patient uh, of, uh, you know, you have this disease and you should be on statin because statin would be able to prevent the heart attack uh, and the control arm. So they saw a difference that 50% of the patient that they were notified started taking statin and they were not on statin versus in control group, only 9% ended up being on statin. So just by doing that, uh, you know, it's amazing that those 50% of the patient uh, were be uh, able uh, to be on statin and have reduction in uh, the heart attack for the next five, 10 years. You know, we're talking with so much excitement, but the reality is a lot of this is relatively new. The AI has been around for a while, but the explosive growth in AI has really happened within the past couple of years. Yeah. And I really think we're at the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, uh, so, you know, what do you think about you know AI in surgery and robotic surgery? Do they do they have a role in surgery or uh, robotic surgery at this point? I I think there's a role. Uh, as surgeons, what we do is very technical, so we have to use our hands. Uh, in things that we have to use our hands for, I don't think AI can help just yet. But I think AI can potentially help us become a better surgeon before we get to the operating room the better planning beforehand, figure out what exactly is going on. So for example, you have a complex valvular uh, issue or a complex anatomical issue with the heart. You can use a lot of AI to kind of predict, you know, what the problem is, what's going to happen after you fix it. So when you're in there, you actually can be a better surgeon. But I think it's hard right now if I'm holding an instrument for AI to hold my hand per se. But on the other hand, there's a lot of AI in robotic surgery. So another aspect that surgeons use um, is um, using robots to actually operate on, on patients. And that's a different animal because the surgeon's actually not holding the instrument. The surgeon's at a console moving a joystick around and that, 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 um, that joystick is a controlling uh, a instrument inside the patient's body. And with that, there's a lot of opportunities because then you can use AI to predict movements. You can make the movements more smooth. You can remo you remove the tremor out of, uh, out of uh, a surgeon's hands, although I don't have a tremor for the record. But uh, for other surgeons, I might have a tremor. But uh, you can take the tremor out, which is fascinating. Uh, so I think there's, there's potential and there is a trend towards maybe more robotic surgery because of all these potentials. So then it would be able to prolong the career of the surgeon too? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. And for sure. Yeah, no. Uh, no, I, uh, in procedure uh, side also that I think at this point, uh, I don't think AI has a role in the cath lab while we are doing the mm -hmm. procedure. But for sure, 
in terms of planning the procedure, right. it can help a lot. Like it can give you a roadmap. So in the cath lab, you know, I know you you and I do tavers, but it can give you exact roadmap of where. Uh, that curve in the aorta is going to happen, have you start turning or, or trying to cross a valve and, and trying to get it through uh, uh, that small stiff wire uh, uh, across a, a small orifice area. Yeah. It could definitely help guide you in that front as well. Yeah. But, but maybe one day, you know, there can be, the catheters can be steerable with the AI in the background and you just kind of launch it and, and let it go and it kind of finds its way uh, to the right place. Yeah, and I think AI probably could, uh, you know, help us giving really good informed consent for the patient also. Uh, it may be able to individualize that what are the chances of complication for the particular patient? Because, you know, when we quote the complication to a patient, uh, those are general, uh, uh, you know, complication rate. They are not specific for that patient. Right. He may be or she may be high risk for something uh, or lower risk of something uh, of a certain procedure. Uh, but we sort of quote just a standard uh, percentage, uh, but you know that patient may be a high risk for something right. and lower risk for something. And I think giving the informed consent would be better also for the patient. Uh, and I just want to con comment on on statistics of complications in general. You know what we rely on is mass data, population data, and say if you had an aortic valve replacement, your risk of having a major complication would be two percent based off thousands and thousands of data. But it doesn't take into consideration that if you're having it done by Surgeon X at this hospital, at this yeah. time of day, um, uh, what your complications might be, and it can be vastly different. And this is where the, the mass data, the machine learning can help fine tune and better predict adverse outcomes or even good outcomes yeah. along yeah. some lines. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, now, you know, I see that you're wearing whoop. Uh, yeah. And uh, so tell us about, you know, variable tech uh, and uh, how it's going to impact uh, how we, you know, take care of ourselves and uh, guide us for our health. I think it's also going to transform what, how much insight we know about our bodies, but also how much uh, uh, potential there is for us to uh, better take care of ourselves. So, for example, uh, I don't get any proceeds from Whoop. I do not get any commission. <laughs> but I tell you what the Whoop does do is it measures your heart rate uh, 24 seven, the Apple watch does that too. It has AI, AI algorithms to know how much you slept at what, um, a depth you slept. But the forward thinking part of it is like, okay, well you are in a sleep debt. You have to go to bed at X time. So it'll tell me, you know, to get your full, full, you know, sleeps rest, you should go to bed at 10 o'clock, you know, and, and you need to wake up at, you can wake up at this time. So that's where the technology comes in, you know, the, the personal technology using the, the, the data banks of, 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 of information out there to then predict what the best amount of sleep you might get. Mm -hmm. um, what, the, the, the nice thing about this technology too is that, and how it's related to medicine, is that there's definitely some data suggests that in patients or in people who have complications or diseases, there are probably changes in your biometrics that you're not aware, you're not cognit cognitively aware just yet, but it happens. You know, it, it, maybe your heart rate gets a little bit faster. Maybe your uh, you know, QR interval gets tighter. You know, a lot of things can potentially happen. We don't feel it or see it, but these technologies can pick up on that. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of uh, research in device development using um, biometrics, whether it be the Whoop, the Fitbit, other companies out there uh, to better predict uh, potential complications after surgery, better predict even potential diseases, you know, maybe yeah. if you have cancer or something that you can better, uh, predict that. So I think there's a, a huge uh, opportunity in that and I think the field's completely open right now. Yeah, you. I, I think what you're outlining is that remote patient monitoring right. after having a procedure or surgery and it would be so powerful that if we can, because one of the things that we get, uh, uh, you know, ranked on is also readmission rate, yep. uh, right? Uh, and if we are able to prevent the readmission and pick something up that if, uh, you know, patients are based on the remote patient monitoring right. and uh, see them in the office before it gets too late that they have to get admitted uh, uh, and, and keeping them out of the hospital. Uh, and I think that's where the future is. Uh, many major health institutions are basically investing money to make sure that uh, they're able to take care of some of uh, the illnesses at uh, uh, at home yeah. uh, so uh, you know 
some institutions have, uh, you know, uh, spent money to decrease the in hospital uh, admission by 10 yeah. percent in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, the you know I think the other side too is also gives the patients a peace of mind too, knowing that they are being constantly monitored by not only uh, the physician, but they're being you know things are being picked up. It might be able to pick up. Well, you know something's happening. You should probably go see a doctor sooner than later. Yeah, uh, and I think that might give some folks a little bit uh, uh, peace of mind. Yeah, let me. You, you talked a little about research. Can you tell me more about the potential for using? whether it be Fitbit or any other kind of technology out there to really kind of advance medicine and, and uh, do research or, may, or maybe any uh, potential research projects that you might have using uh, AI technology. Yeah, so with AI technology, uh, the research for sure uh, uh, that you can do like uh, with the Apple uh, Watch, uh, you know, there are algorithms out there that even with the one lead EKG that Apple uh, Watch does, uh, you know, you can predict the occult uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, uh, so that is something that you can uh, do that. Uh, how many patients or people are out there who don't have the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and those who are wearing the Apple Watch? Uh, and what's the incidence of occult atrial fibrillation? Uh, because that's a big deal. As we know that the atrial fibrillation increases your risk of stroke. So maybe by doing this, we can prevent some of this stroke also in the future. And, uh, you know, I think you and I both are working on uh, um, the AI research with uh, some of the FIU, uh, uh, you know, project that we are working on where, uh, you know, having uh, the auscultation as, uh, you know, an evaluation for the valvular heart disease and pick the valvular heart disease earlier in the disease process before it becomes too late. Uh, and as you pointed out earlier, uh, just give you an example of aortic stenosis, there's 50% mortality at two years uh, once they have severe aortic stenosis and symptom uh, started. So that's, you know, having 6.25% uh, mortality every three months, that's a huge number. I mean, for us, uh, you know, when we do a procedure, having a mortality more than uh, 1% yeah. is high sure. and more than 8% we consider a high risk uh, right. for surgery. So, um, you know, those are some of the research uh, that we are uh, doing. And, you know, and AI would also have, a, you know, help the student and us uh, in writing the paper also, yeah. right? Because uh, previously how we used to write the paper and reference the article was so cumbersome where, uh, you know, Initially, the process was manual, where we would uh, reference the article for uh, the statement that we are using from the article uh, manually, and then EndNote came; it uh, made it slightly easier. But now, uh, you know, uh, the AI can help us reference those uh, article, and it would take few minutes, uh, and uh, you don't have to spend days, uh, uh, you know, making sure that your article uh, references are uh, in good place. Uh. Well, as you know, one of our uh, most prestigious journals and, and most uh, highly impact journal is New England Journal of Medicine, and AI has become such an important topic that now New England Journal of Medicine has a dedicated issue on AI, New England Journal of Medicine AI, and the very first uh, um, journal was actually released in January 2024. But what's interesting, if you dive deep into the author uh, rules for writing articles, the New England Journal of Medicine actually condones the use of generative AI for writing articles, which is a little bit uh, maybe controversial. I don't know. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on it. But but they recognize that the technology is here. It's going to stay. They're going to embrace and adopt it with a, a set of rules and guidelines if you're going to use it. What are your thoughts on no, using think, using AI to write journal articles? I, I think that's fine. Uh, you know, and I maybe, uh, you know, you can ask uh, if the chat GPT-4 is being used uh, for that. Uh, you can uh, ask question multiple times and then uh, based on your style, it would be able to, uh, you know, write the article. Uh, um, and as long as it's being done with some, uh, you know, supervision and obviously there's a good input to the article, uh, uh, I think that's okay. Uh, you know, uh, we're going to have more research coming out uh, into the medical field as as long as the data is uh, uh, you know robust, uh, uh, because that's all we care about, right? Right. And I think the way the New England Journal of Medicine defends it is that at the end of the day, whatever is written, you have to own the data and you're responsible for the data, and you disclose that I am responsible for this data, 
and um, and how it was generated, you know, is, is up to you. But they do say that you can't have, have chat GPT as a co-author. <laughs> Well, well, Nish, it was incredible to talk to you about AI. I think uh, you and I agree that we're only at the tip of the iceberg and um, look forward to further discussions about hey, how AI is going to change uh, not only medicine, but humanity. But uh, I think you and I probably agree that it needs to be um, uh, regulated uh, and, and closely watched. Uh, AI now is at a vanguard of not only taking cardiovascular medicine surgery, but the whole field of medicine to levels only recently dreamt of. It's paramount to practice practicing physicians to stay current on all new technologies, incorporate them into their daily practice. This promise for the field of medicine gives us tremendous hope for saving and enhancing countless lives, not only for our community, but on a global scale. Any final thoughts? What's your prediction of the most uh, influential technology using AI that might happen a year from now? A year from now? A uh, year from now... I think as we talk about, you know, having a EMR cross-reference, that's going to be uh, more utilized because that's that's already here. So uh, the more institution would start using it, uh, and then eventually, you know, I would say that uh, that EKG, uh, the uh, you know EKG as something a tool based of the EKG, yeah, yeah. Well, the field of innovation continues and with it hopes for millions uh, in the future. As these proven advancements come into view, we will continue to bring the best treatments for our patients and colleagues. To find out more about the topics covered on the doc to doc podcast, please visit physicianresources.baptisthealth.net.